Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Wilson Dialogue. We are joined tonight here by Nam Namri Nanawal Elder Paul Howes, who will graciously welcome us to his country. Paul? Uh, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Baladu Yaba, Nyambri Wogalu, Wurugurudri Nyang. I'm speaking Nyambri Wogalu, Wurugurudri language. Buru Marambang, Yelangalangbu, Gibabango Wogabo, Migabo, Dira Nilbang, Maranya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, young women, young men, distinguished guests, the Honourable Mr. Kevin Rudd, uh, Vice Chancellor Brian Smith, and Uncle Bruce Pascoe. Nyari in Jamali, Nyamri, Gamal, Wogalu, Wallablo, Nunawa, Nagaraga, Wiradri, Mujigang, Yanang, Mujiang. My respects to Nyamri, Gamal, Wogalu, Wallablo, Nunawa, Nagaraga, Wiradri, elders past and present. Nyari in Jamarabu, Mujigang, Nurambanji, Guwu, Ningi, Yiridu. My respects to all elders from other nations here tonight. Nyamri, Nunawa, Maranya, Gurubari, Ninyoga, Nurambango, Dara. Nyamri, Nunawa, people welcome you all to country. Nyambri Wogulu, Nunawam, Maranya, Nurmangu Dara, Injamara, Naru, Boya, Nyang. Respecting Nyambri Wogulu, Nunawu country, language and law. Injamara. Respect, honor, go slow, take responsibility. Mamba Wara Naminyagu, Wujig Binya, Wara Daragu, Winningala Gubaligu. Looking to see, listening to hear, and learning to understand. Injamara. Magagiri Biringa Bogongu Dirinda. Respect can be found in the journey of the Bogong moths in the mountains. Injimara, Bala Bidada, Bina Bida Wurawin Nyambi Nunawudara. Respect is in the rivers quietly moving through Nyambi Nunawu country. Injimara, Bala Walamwanga Dabu, Mudan Mudan Dabu, Bamu Yu Gurungam Bida. Respect is in the grinding stones and the carved trees made long ago by Nyambi Wogulu, Wallabaloa country. Murun Waginya, Yinjamara, Murun Muru, Wurun Binadara. Living a Yinjamara respectful way of life cares for country. Yinjamara, Wurun Bida Marandu Gobu, Giyira Gobu, Yandu Gobu. Respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, the present, and the future. This welcome the country is made in the spirit of peace and a desire for harmony for all peoples of the modern ACT and surrounds. And with this work on the country, our main aim as local custodians to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post contact of the region. We have cared for Mother Earth since the dawn of time and evidence of our occupation can be seen everywhere throughout the land. Our sovereignty, our occupation, our signature is in the land, not just our DNA. And taking care of country is important to us. We continue to respect our obligations to protect and conserve our culture and heritage and care for our ancestral lands and waters. Our ancestral places include Nyambri, Wirrawa, Amungula, Namiji, Gajimbi, Jinandaraguri, Yaru, Tidbinbilla, Jalagang, Yuri, Yara, all our billas, the rivers, Kup, uh, the Gubragandra, Gudra Digby, Murrumbidgee rivers, and our key totems are the Umbai Yukonbrak, the crow, and the Mullian eagle. The land, the plants, the animals, the rivers, the mounds, it's all connected, not just environmentally, but also spiritually. We must remember under the concrete and the steel of our cities and towns as a rich, powerful 70,000 year history, First Nation history, which is now a shared history that belongs to all of us. In conclusion, I'd like to talk about the law of the land. The law of the land talks about giving respect and honour to all people in all parts of the country. Giving honour, being respectful, being polite, being gentle and patient with all. Then people will respect you. Respect everything living and growing. Hold fast to each other and empower each other. Yinjamara, mara, mara, nyinyinya, girama, maranya. Respect shapes us and lifts up the people. On behalf of our elders and our families, in the spirit of reconciliation, I say Gurubari, welcome, and Wuragawuri, thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for that wonderful welcome to country. I too would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands 
in every ways we meet, pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'm here uh, on the edge of Amangula Creek, uh, part of the Nalulamambri territory. Tonight, we are gonna focus on the very timely issue of addressing climate change beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has changed the way we live and operate in our uh, everyday lives. We have seen state, national, and international governments mobilize to prevent the spread of the virus and work towards a vaccine. Comparatively in Australia, climate change has been politicized and government action stagnant. As a defining issue of our time, the consequences of an action will impact us all. Climate change is arguably the largest crisis humanity faces. As Australia's national university, we are uniquely placed to contribute to public policy and have a critical responsibility to address challenges facing Australia and outside the global pandemic. ANU and the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation are tackling these challenges through our high quality research, leadership capability, and through our strong links with the government. Earlier this year, we became the first major global university and the first in Australia to commit to reaching below zero greenhouse gas emissions. This initiative is spearheaded by our Climate Change Institute, and although it is ambitious, now more than ever, it is absolutely crucial. And I'm pleased we can support the foundation and its scholars who are future leaders in the Australian public service to have these important discussions and embed research and evidence into the development of public policy. Our panel this evening will discuss the potential lessons we can take from COVID-19 and how we can then apply them to the way in which we address climate change. Now, I would like to introduce our keynote guest speaker for this evening, the Honorable Kevin Rudd. Thank you for joining us tonight, Kevin. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome you back to our campus, albeit virtually. I'd also like to thank our other panelists who will be joining us for a discussion later, Dark Emu author and academic Bruce Pascoe and CEO of Climate Works Australia, Anna Scavar uh, Scarbin. Kevin is, of course, an ANU alumnus, having completed his bachelor's degree in Asian studies in 1981 and was awarded an honorary doctorate here in 2016. Kevin was the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, serving as Prime Minister from December 2007 until June 2010, and again then from June until September 2013. While in office, Kevin set in motion major reforms in domestic policy areas, including environment, health, education, industrial relations, social security, and infrastructure. The Rudd government first act included signing the Kyoto Protocol on climate change, which was a significant step forward in Australia's effort to fight climate change domestically and within the international community. He also represented Australia at the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit committing states to limit temperature increases to two degrees. He led Australia's response to the global financial crisis, reviewed by the International Monetary Fund as the most effective stimulus strategy of all major economies. In 2008, Kevin delivered the national apology to the stolen generations in Australia and committed to closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Since leaving office, Kevin has had numerous senior roles for international organizations and academic institutions. He is the president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York, a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, and a distinguished fellow at Chatham House in London. Kevin continues to be a passionate environmentalist and a firm believer that climate change poses a real and present threat to humanity and our future. It is great to have you with us here tonight, and I'm looking forward to your insights. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, um, Brian, and greetings to everyone at the Australian National University. Um, and thank you very much, Paul, uh, for the welcome to country. And I honor the first Australians on whose lands we meet uh, and whose cultures we celebrate as the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We all know that uh, this uh, corona crisis has generated the biggest economic and social crisis Australia has faced since the war and probably since the Great Depression. Responding to international crises through our own national means is a critical challenge for effective Australian public policy. Responding to international economic crises, acting early 
and effectively as soon as the evidence presents itself is critical. I believe we did that during the global financial crisis, enabling Australia to avoid the recession which all other advanced economies in the world suffered. Acting early and effectively is also critical for national pandemic management. We did that in 2009 when we faced the H1N9 virus and uh, we acted appropriately. We also managed to avoid significant impact on the economy. And acting early and effectively on the existential crisis which climate change represents is also critical for our nation's future. Again, in our period in office, we sought to do that. We sought to do that by ensuring that Australia was part of the international legal instruments underpinning global climate change action, the Kyoto Protocol at the time. We, un we sought to do that by being active leaders in global climate change action uh, through the Copenhagen Conference in 2009. We sought to do that uh, through our national action and bringing in a, under law, a mandatory renewable energy target. Australian renewable energies back then represented only 4% of total energy supply. They now represent 21% of national energy supply because we made legislation count. And we sought to introduce a price on carbon only to see our carbon pollution reduction scheme voted down twice in the Senate through an unseemly collaboration between the Liberal Party and the Green Party. These actions count. But the generic principle of all of these actions, whether it's on the economy, whether it's on pandemic management or climate change management, is to act on the basis of the evidence when it presents itself to you, to act effectively and early, deploying the full range of weapons available to you and the past policy arsenal of government. It's easy to forget that 2020 began with the Great Australian Inferno. And when the statisticians look back, they will see that these fires compounded an already faltering Australian economic growth rate. Those bushfires uh, also choked our cities, shifted the psychology of the nation and brought home two stark realities. First, just how vulnerable we all are to climate change. And second, just how far behind the rest of the world Australia now is in responding to climate change. For a moment, we realised how dangerous it was to have become what I've described in earlier writings as the complacent country. No longer Donald Horne's lucky country, instead the complacent country. Complacent about the warnings we've received, complacent about the deployment of the actions which have been necessary, particularly in the period since the international community agreed on a common course at Paris in 2015. Besides the United States under Trump and Brazil under Bolsonaro, we in Australia are the only major economy that does not take the need for action on climate change seriously. Nor do we recognise the economic opportunities that will come with that action. I would argue that this is bad company to keep, Trump and Bolsonaro. This ultimately is not a question of ideology. Boris Johnson's Conservative government in the United Kingdom is in fact one of the shining lights for climate change action around the world. In the midst of this crisis, the, mo the most coal dependent economies and right wing governments in Europe have backed a European Green New Deal as a massive pillar uh, of their continent's recovery. Even China has now announced that they will achieve clim climate neutrality by 2060. That means being net carbon neutral. Only Australia and the United States among the developed economies refuse to embrace carbon neutrality as their mid-century target. Why is that important? Because it reflects the underpinning science of keeping temperature increases within 1.5 degrees centigrade by century's end, and therefore building back in terms of the quantum of greenhouse gas emissions which need to be taken out uh, of the atmosphere that are, would otherwise be there, and therefore creating a trajectory towards those targets by having an appropriate policy setting for mid-century, 2050, 
and in the near term by 2030 as required under the Paris Agreement. That's why having these mid-century and nearer term targets is so fundamentally important. They determine the actions we take now. But here in Australia, instead of using the summer fires and the coronavirus as an opportunity to accelerate the necessary shift to a zero emissions global economy, Australia has chosen to use it as an excuse to delay climate change action even further. All the while getting in a tongue twist about our refusal to back a long-term target to reach net zero emissions by 2050. This is despite the fact that almost uniquely, industry, business, and the unions alike, as well as every state and territory uh, government in our nation, Australia, uh, back net zero by 2050. Only the Commonwealth government has declined. This failure puts both our people and our economy at greater risk. And I fear that seeking to untangle our carbon intensive economy much later than the rest of the world could in fact be what causes the next recession in Australia as the global economy increasingly walks away from fossil fuel dependency. Australia cannot afford to let this crisis go to waste. This is genuinely a nation building opportunity, if ever there was one, including to embrace a genuinely green recovery. This does not mean I think the government will necessarily have a Damascus Road experience, perhaps they are beyond that, but it does mean the government needs to be held to account for refusing to paint an economic picture for our recovery, which has climate action at the heart of it. For my part, here is what the government's green economic recovery should look like. Number one, we need large-scale investment in re the renewable energy industry, including the position to position Australia as a clean energy superpower. The hard truth is that we can create new jobs, create new industries, and new wealth supplying clean energy at home and clean energy technology abroad. This should include investments to accelerate the development of large-scale energy infrastructure projects, such as the Green Hydrogen Project being explored in the Pilbara in the West. It also includes R&D for other emerging clean energy technologies. Instead, we become obsessed with the possibility of a gas-led recovery, replete with the idea of building pipelines from east to west. That is the modern day equivalent of dusting off a defense plan to buy more horses and bayonets because they worked in the past. It ignores the fact that gas should be a transition fuel to renewables. Investing in this without also backing in renewables is only a recipe for an even higher emissions production over time. It also means that we can more than certainly kiss goodbye to any hope of meeting the targets we set for ourselves under the Paris Agreement. Second, we need to fundamentally rewire our national electricity system. As Anthony Albanese outlined recently in his budget reply, Albanese was right when he said our national electricity system was designed for a different century, let alone today when one in four households already has solar panels and some states have huge renewable energy infrastructure. Not only would this inject $40 billion alone into our economy, it would also create new jobs, especially in regional Australia, and it would make our entire electricity system and therefore our economy more stable. Third, we do need to recognise electricity prices are too high in this country. And now more than ever, this needs to change as a wave of inequality and unemployment sweeps our country as the coronavirus-induced recession continues. That is why, uh, as we did a decade ago in the global financial crisis, we need to heed Ken Henry's advice and go hard, go early, and go households in order to accelerate this shift, especially for those who will benefit from it most. Solar panels should become a mandatory part of the National Building Code for all new structures, including to spread the economic benefit from the government's own mooted construction boom. Incentives should also be provided for the retrofitting of the remaining three quarters of the existing national housing stock. And the government should consider subsidising the cost of the installations for social housing to immediately put money in the pockets of our country's most vulnerable by wiping out huge parts of their electricity bills. We also have the benefit of knowing that these kinds of measures work in Australia. For example, my government's efficient energy uh, energy efficient homes package 
saw insulation installed in 1.2 million homes, or 20% of our entire national housing stock. Yes, there are problems with the program. There were four tragic deaths out of a total of 16,000 people employed in this program. And they were due to a failure on the part of four subcontractors failing to properly apply workplace and safety procedures and standards. But as the Royal Commission itself found at the time, the number of fires caused by ceiling insulation was in fact much less than the pre-program industry standard across our nation. But the important point to reflect on is this, despite what the Murdoch media may write about such programs, is that this measure alone, the Energy Efficient Homes Program, has been estimated to have saved approximately 20,000 gigawatt hours of electricity, or, or roughly 19.5 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent through to today. That is a 10% drop in our emissions in real terms. That is through energy efficiency measures. Solar panels on the energy supply front, proper insulation on the energy efficiency front as simple examples of what can be done in both dimensions of climate change action. Finally, we need to fundamentally overhaul our regulatory framework to keep pace with this economic shift. Every financial crisis, including the GFC, has resulted in major and lasting changes to the national regulatory environment. The opportunity here is to finally bring corporate and prudential regulation in line with the risks posed by climate change. I particularly want to commend the work of the Centre for Policy Development and Climate Works Australia, among others, for their efforts on the Climate and Recovery Initiative. Anyone who doesn't think that climate change is already impacting industry needs their head read. Speak to any one of the world's major insurance companies and look carefully at the impact already on insurance premiums, business, business loss, business replacement, as well as insurance premiums against natural disasters more generally. It's important that the that many of the statutory institutions that my government established, including the Climate Change Authority, are urgently re-established to bring back dispassionate advice to governments on our level of climate action and to identify areas for how this can be continued to scale up in the future. To conclude, the biggest barrier to all of this is obviously political leadership. Prime Minister Morrison, for reasons best known to himself, has chosen not to lead on climate change action and instead simply to evade. Leadership is critical. Leadership costs, but leadership is essential. We need to remember that climate change action at its heart is a massive jobs and wealth creation plan that is also entirely in keeping with this current government's priorities to deliver affordable and reliable energy. And to put it bluntly, it's a question as to whether these factors are more important during a global recession than a small minority that will continue to cling to fossil fuels no matter what, almost as a matter of deep religion. Indeed, as groups like Beyond Zero Emissions have shown, a large-scale renewables plan for Australia would create over 100,000 jobs in the next two years alone that otherwise would not exist, over 70% of which would be in regional Australia. And within three years, it would increase real wages by 1% nationally at a time when real wages are currently lower than they were a decade ago. This vision would make Australia safer, stronger, fairer and more prosperous and more sustainable. We are the custodians of the Great Barrier Reef. We are the custodians of the Murray-Darling Basin. We are the custodians of this vast dry land. It's our responsibility to act. No longer would we need to be the international pariah holding up global agreements on the world stage or staring down the barrel of carbon tariffs from the European Union or a future Democrat administration in Washington through Australia's continued failure to act. Australia has a choice in this crisis. We either have courage, courage of leadership, courage of conviction, enough to see a greater vision for our country anchored in sustainability, Will we allow our government to cower in the face of the Murdoch media climate change denialists who have been leading the charge against climate change action in this country for more than a decade? Climate change remains the greatest moral challenge of our generation. 
That's because it requires us to think in intergenerational terms. The choice should not be that hard. It's a time for a genuinely green recovery to be at the heart of our national economic vision for this country, one that matches the moment and one that inspires the nation. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, for those <laughs> remarks. Um, so great to, to have you on board here. Uh, I just wanted to check that we're getting into this discussion now. I hope that I haven't jumped in too early, but um, everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Janice Peterson. I'm from SBS World News, but I've taken the night off. Usually I'd be in the studio at, at SBS getting ready to read World News, but I'm delighted to be hosting the 2020 Wilson Dialogue this evening and participating in a Zoom call I actually want to be involved in. So um, it's my great pleasure to be here. So thank you once again to the Honourable Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister. Kevin, thank you so much for that wonderful keynote address. We heard there about the importance of responding early and effectively to global crises. And it was really fascinating to hear some of the frustrations and the challenges that you faced trying to make good on some of those commitments to climate change while in office. And also where you think Australia sits at the, at the moment on the world stage when it comes to things like carbon targets and more importantly, what you believe what needs to be done now. Now to our audience, Kevin has kindly agreed to stay on to talk more about those topics. But at this point, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel who will be joining Kevin for further discussion for this 2020 Wilson Dialogue addressing climate change beyond COVID-19 pandemic. We have Anna Scarback, CEO of Climate Works Australia, co-founded by my foundation and Monash University, and has been the head of the foundation since it was created back in 2009, at really leading the push for low emission economies. And is also the director of Impact Investment Group, the Green Building Council of Australia, and of the Centre for New Technologies. She's been a member of the Blueprint Institute's Strategic Advisory Council, the Grattan Institute's Energy Program, and a whole lot more. She was also a founding director of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation from 2012 to 2017. We're also delighted today to have Professor Bruce Pascoe join us. Bruce of course, is a writer, an editor, and an anthologist. He's best known, of course, for his work, Dark Emu, which examines and re-examines colonial accounts of Aboriginal people in Australia, and also gives evidence of pre-colonial agriculture, engineering, and building construction by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Bruce is pretty much won every award. He's received the New South Wales Premier's Book of the Year Award in 2016 for Dark Emu. In 2018, Bruce was awarded the Australia Council Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literature. He's also a professor at the Jambunna Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at UTS. And we're so fortunate, aren't we, to have people of this calibre join us for this esteemed uh, panel. But we love democracy here. We appreciate that a lot of you watching tonight also have very pertinent points to make. So we'd love you to get involved. It's pretty simple. During the panel discussion, you will all have the ability to submit questions using the Q&A function. So please seek that out. Submit your questions during the forum. And it means that I'll get to put some of those questions to our panel. So please make the most of that opportunity. And I can see everyone's on board. Uh, hopefully, Anna, um, you're welcome to join in now. Anna, I think I can't see you at the moment, but hopefully um, I'll get to see you Hello, soon. Hello, I'm here, yes, Janet. Wonderful, wonderful. Kevin, as you mentioned there, large-scale policy action on climate change can be very challenging, can't it? So how do you turn that back and forth debate into action with long-term impact when you, you're facing the realities of uh, tough conditions in Parliament? How are we going to see action? How are we going to see action on that? 
There are two impediments to climate change action in Australia. Uh, one is a Liberal National Party who have concluded that uh, opposition to climate change uh, constitutes good politics uh, because in outer suburban Australia and regional Australia, uh, they equate action on climate change with uh, damage to industry and losses to employment. So they have concluded that that is good politics even if any rational person would conclude it's horrendous policy for Australia. So what do you do about that? Uh, it means that a laser sharp focus has to be brought to bear on the uh, government of Australia and the political party it represents in terms of its failure to deal with Australia's long-term future and the fact that their strategy is ultimately destructive of jobs and destructive of Australian living standards. The second challenge is this. We must launch uh, collectively a national fusillade against the Murdoch media. And the reason is the Murdoch media have been the echo chamber of climate change denialism for the best part of the decade. And they have made respectable the political uh, approach which the Liberal National Party have taken to climate change over that period of time, enabling them to turn it into, quote, a political winner to be climate change denialists rather than uh, what should be the case uh, as far as uh, any normal public policy prescription for the country would be. Look at around the world. These debates are not really had anywhere in Europe. There's no Murdoch media in Europe outside of Britain, and there it is not a dominant player. They're not debates which are held in Canada. It is only a massively partisan issue in Australia and the United States where the Murdoch media is so dominant in both countries. So you ask me, uh, what needs to be done. Uh, the policy script for Australia is clear. It's about renewables, it's about a carbon price, it's about energy efficiency, and it's about global leadership and global action. What's stopping it? Liberal National Party and the Murdoch Party. They're the two which have to be moved out of the road. Otherwise, Australia will not realise its national potential as a centre for renewable and green energy in the future. It is difficult Am I sorry? Let me just check. I'm not on mute. Um, it is difficult, though, isn't it, Mr. Rudd, to get uh, action on climate change, get that momentum happening when really there's been one story this year, and that's been COVID 19. How do we get um, people interested again and more engaged in this, particularly when given the tough economic conditions we're facing at the moment? It's really drop, dropped off the agenda. Well, uh, you come from an industry which decides what's on the agenda and what's not. Um, it's called the news media. Uh, that's not my industry, that's yours. So whether it's um, uh, SBS or whether it's the ABC, or whether it's the Fairfax media, you decide, A, whether a story is reported or not. You decide the slanting of the reporting, that is, what the headline story is um, and uh, how it's presented. And thirdly, on the key media narrative, which is run by the Murdoch media, which is climate change action destroys jobs and economic security, as opposed to the counter narrative, which happens to be the truth, uh, that climate change action builds jobs and creates new employment opportunities right across the country and is good for the climate, good for the environment and good for the economy. So it is a question not of, as it were, the effectiveness of political advocacy. The Australian Labor Party uh, has uh, had a clear and consistent position on this for a decade. Uh, the challenge is to mobilise the nation uh, to, including the media of the nation, against the two political operatives standing in the road of this uh, policy prescription for our nation's future. One's the Murdoch Party, the second's the Liberal National Party, and you, the rest of the media, frankly, have a responsibility, in my judgment, to again place this as centre stage, irrespective of what's happening in terms of coronavirus land. All right, fair cop, Mr. Rudd. Thank you. I'll definitely keep it on board. Anna, I'd like to bring you into the conversation now. COVID, of course, has forced a lot of us to work from home. Fewer cars on the road, planes being used, of course, a downturn in the aviation sector, manufacturing, heavy industry slowed, emissions dropped for a moment there. Does that have a lasting impact, though? No, it's temporary. When restrictions are lifted and activity resumes, the existing machines, engines, vehicles, and technology will all turn back on. 
the lockdown has felt really long to us, um, but it's actually only a few months. And most importantly, that time has not been spent replacing and upgrading the technology we use to instead install versions which don't create emissions when we use it. The only way to a safe climate is to remove the excess emissions from our economy and atmosphere. Every year we produce more than what the earth can absorb and that's what's been going on for the last century. So bringing it back into balance or achieving net zero emissions is the central goal of the Paris Agreement and of the IPCC science and evidence, carbon neutral or, or net zero. And we've got three decades left based on the current rates of warming. We can do it and it's a technological solution. It's about re replacing the equipment and, and technology that we already use to do so with versions that don't produce emissions. So it actually um, can be done without as much change to the way we live and work as what COVID has produced. We've seen massive changes in the way we live and work. And our research over the last decade has shown that we can indeed achieve a net zero emissions economy without this sort of change to the way we live and work. We can still live in homes and buildings like the ones we live in. We can drive in cars, um, even ships and planes are looking at how they can decarbonise. Um, industry can still prosper and grow um, and so we can make things and mine things and have zero emissions mining in Australia as well, provided the technology that we use is upgraded to use the zero emissions versions of that technology. So it requires investment and it requires thousands of transactions of upgrading that equipment, whether it's small equipment in, in homes and buildings or large equipment in mines and, um, and, and obviously in electricity generation and replacing the old fleet with newer versions. So it's that activity, it actually requires a proactive activity to eliminate the emissions from the economy rather than what we've seen during COVID restrictions, which is the omission of activity. We need the proactive investment in new um, technology to replace the old. It can be done to allow life largely as we know it or as we knew it, if you like, pre-COVID. Um, and that's what's often overlooked. We talk about the, the four pillars of decarbonisation uh, you, three of them relate to energy use. Using energy much more smartly, um, we, we, you know, we can halve the amount of energy that a building uses, for example, with technology that's already invented today. We don't yet have a market of consumers and suppliers that enable that technology to be installed in a widespread way. The second pillar is, of course, uh, renewable energy, so zero emissions electricity, which we know how to do. It's happening, but not fast enough yet. And the third pillar is then you switch your fuels to the zero emissions version. So you switch to electricity wherever you can. So we can electrify a lot of passenger transport. We can electrify a lot of industry. We can electrify the homes, um, you know, the energy that our homes use. You can't electrify everything. There are liquid fuels and gas that's still used for longer forms transport. So we're now looking at what are the zero emissions versions of that. Hydrogen produced with renewable en energy can be a major substitute for a lot of the existing use of fossil fuel that isn't replaced by electricity. And that can power long form transport. And the last, the hardest part, aviation, uh, will need biofuels or sin fuels, although there, there, there are trials even of hydrogen fuel cell planes. So it can be done, uh, but it requires these steps, these three energy steps, and the fourth being sequestration, sequester the rest. That's using nature in particular, uh, but also some technology, industrial uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, for any of the last residual emissions for some industrial processes that we aren't able to substitute in those other ways. Although every year we're seeing new developments on that. So I thought I'd just outline why until those things happen, we, we're not going to achieve zero emissions. It's not just about pressing pause. It's about actively investing in the four pillars. But we can do all of that while still living, flying, driving, making, manufacturing just as we are, provided we're actively upgrading that technology. Thanks so much, Anna. I saw you nodding your head there, Bruce, at times. I'd love to get your take on, on things. And, and we will, can I just say to our audience, we will definitely, I'll be asking some of your questions in a moment, but I just want to get um, Bruce's thoughts for a moment. First Nations people, of course, have been managing the land for millennia. So Bruce, how do you think improved engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities might change the way we approach something as huge as climate change? 
Well, I think to uh, look at a civilization that uh, operated in this country for 120,000 years uh, successfully and sustainably, uh, there are lessons to be learnt and um, Australia should be clamouring to learn those. They are not the only lessons, but they are certainly things that are worth knowing. And the reliance of Aboriginal people on perennial crops, be they tubers or grains, is a really large part of how the, the rivers and atmosphere were looked after by Aboriginal people. When Australians see the fish kills on the Murray-Darling rivers, when they see that giant dust storm that I drove through in November last year that descended upon Sydney and ended up in the Alps of New Zealand, that's our soil. That's Australian capital that we're sending over to New Zealand uh, by bad farming. It's the wrong crop for the wrong country. And if we were to reduce the amount of ploughing that was done in this country, by growing perennial grasses and cropping the same and grazing the same, growing more Australian tubers, which are perennial plants and can be harvested and remain in the ground using the old Aboriginal techniques, then we go a long way to sequestering carbon and meeting our responsibilities to the world, not just to the world, but to Mother Earth herself. And these are important things to Aboriginal people and these are lessons that we are begging to share uh, with Australians. But underpinning all of that, of course, is the cooperation and the organisation required to do these things. If you control burn across an area the size of two states, uh, you have to do it in conjunction with your neighbours, perhaps neighbours you don't even share a language with. And to do that, the power of government required, but the faith in each other required is enormous. And I, it saddens me that when Australians think about their history, they don't think about government. They don't think that Aboriginal people governed each other. Uh, the society probably began here. If we look at the recent archeology span of old towns, um, it appears they exceed the first town, which I'm told is in Turkey, but it doesn't really matter who's first, who's second. It matters who's still here and how they treated the earth during that time. And that kind of government, that kind of leadership that was adopted time and time and time again by each generation, not without modification, but readopted that faith in the earth that absolute determination not to damage Mother Earth I was, was driven by philosophy, was driven by spirituality, and was driven by incredible statespeople, both men and women. And I, I think this is a treasure for Australia. It's, you know, we're talking about uh, the grains and tubers that I talk about in Dark Emu. Everyone's very excited by that. Um, and we need to be, and we need to do more research in this area. Um, but we need to look at how the first society in the world was governed and how it remained as one culture for over 100,000 years. It doesn't matter whether you believe 100,000 years. You know, the archaeologists at Warrnambool do. Uh, let's say it's 80,000 years. When I went to school, it was 5,000 years. Um, but whatever it is, it's an incredible length of government when most civilizations in the world were done and dusted in 1,000. So what went right in Australia? Was it just isolation? Or was there a philosophical strength here from which we can learn today? And I believe that's the case. That law that it drove that ancient government is still alive today and is being practiced today and will be practiced this weekend uh, in all sorts of ways. And I'm, I'm gladdened that I can actually witness it um, because 
until you see it, uh, you don't understand the generosity of it, mm. the generosity towards women, because in, in my culture, um, everything begins and ends with the term through the mother. We come through the mother. Um, we, are, we owe our complete debt to the mother, and that mother, of course, is not just our physical mother, but Mother Earth. A government like that looks a lot like New Zealand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bruce. Wonderful to hear from you. Kevin, we've got a, a question here from someone in our audience. Chell Lyons, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Chell Lyons wants to know, how important do you think the US election outcome will be to the success of the Paris Agreement? Fundamental. Um, Trump decided to leave uh, the uh, Paris Accord. Um, Biden has committed to rejoin it probably his first day in office. Um, why is that really important? It's not a question of high symbolism. It's a question of uh, two things. One, with the Paris Agreement, you buy onto uh, and buy into uh, an arrangement uh, which has at its core the environmental science. And the environmental science says that if we allow a temperature increase beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade, uh, in this 21st century, uh, we will experience uh, irreparable uh, climate dysfunction uh, for the biosphere, all of us. Um, therefore, um, that's entrenched uh, in the Paris Agreement. Secondly, what flows from that is the mathematics of uh, how much uh, further greenhouse gas emissions uh, the atmosphere can absorb uh, for the duration of this century in order to keep temperatures increases within that margin. And then thirdly, it therefore outlines a framework of so-called nationally determined commitments or NDCs for each and every nation state. So for America, the second largest emitter in the world, not to be in that arrangement is frankly a global scandal, point one, in terms of the ethical argument but it's also in a material argument, fundamentally damaging for the rest of us. Um, and the further point is this, if America is not within that agreement or accord, it lessens the pressure uh, on the Chinese, the single largest emitters on the planet, uh, to take their responsibilities globally seriously. China as a contribution of global greenhouse gas emissions will peak somewhere about 25, 28% of total emissions. Um, and if they are outside the Paris Agreement because the Americans choose to abandon it forever, uh, then that spells absolute mayhem for the rest of us. Now, the Chinese have decided to operate within that agreement so far, though we have to cast a sceptical eye to what they're doing offshore with the intensity of coal-fired power station investment in the Belt and Road Initiative countries. But let me tell you, it would be a damn side worse if they were completely outside the uh, regime established by the Paris Agreement. Finally, China's about to release its 14th five-year plan to cover the period 2021 to 2025. Um, it, will, it again is based on the mathematics of how do we stay within 1.5 to two degrees centigrade increase this century. And its own uh, set of national arrangements flow from that. So if the Americans walk away from Paris forever, and cause the Chinese to conclude that they are Robinson Crusoe by remaining there as the world's largest emitter, then God save the rest of us. That's why this presidential election is crucial for any of us who take climate change policy and politics seriously. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, Bruce, I think we've got one audience question here for you from Ian Cumming. Thank you, Ian, for getting involved. Ian asks, how do you bring the benefits of the Indigenous culture back into the current national political conduct? Are those who have come across the sea to become more like those who have been here for 100k years? How do we do that? How do we achieve that? We teach our children about the the incredible history that this country has experienced, the full history, 
because Aboriginal history is Australian history, teach them that history, uh, but also teach them their love of the earth and their responsibility towards it. I, um, I've got four grandchildren, so I can't afford uh, to be pessimistic. Um, there are good reasons to be extremely worried, but we have to have hope. Uh, we mustn't allow ourselves to become um, immobilised with the fear of total destruction. There are things we can do, and we have to encourage our children to do those things in our stead. We have to encourage our neighbours to take it seriously. Talk to those who we know will not agree with us, but we can change things. We will soften their demeanour a fraction and will have changed things greatly. It's about conversations and it's about respect. Um, Paul House you know, was spot on that speech from Ngunnawal uh, language, mentioned respect about 13 times. That's what it's all about, respecting each other, not disrespect. And Kevin has mentioned an election overseas and really is about respect for people on the earth as against disrespect. And, but I have faith in Australia. People tell me I'm uh, foolish for doing so, but I have faith, faith in Australians. Look at how we have responded to the pandemic compared to many other countries. And I think um, Australian states have been pretty well governed in this regard, but it also relied on the goodwill of the people. And I'm throwing my hat in the ring for the, the goodwill of Australians to realise that we can do things productively and we can still love our country. And once again, as Kevin said, there are, and Anna said the same, there are jobs in uh, looking after planet Earth. Uh, there is wealth in looking after planet Earth, and there's certainly survival. Thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, Anna, I think I might be able to direct this one at you. Um, someone from the audience named Kevin wants to know, and this has been a, a question that keeps coming up from our audience, is basically what's an alternative to coal? How can the coal industry be replaced? Um, what are the viable alternatives? Because it is, of course, such a huge contributor to our economy under climate change at the moment? There are many uh, alternatives. So uh, Australia is blessed with world-class renewable electricity and... Uh, Sorry, Anna, your, um, somehow your audio has gone a, a little bit funny. Can you maybe unmute mute and unmute and let's see if that helps us? Is that any better? It's a little bit fuzzy. I'm not sure whether to press on or not because I'm very keen to hear your response there about um, alternatives. So maybe just keep it pithy and we'll, we'll crack on. No, I think Anna's actually frozen there. Oh, Janice, um, yes, while jump in, um, Anna is working on that audio, mm. um, I had solar a panel people at the farm today installing the most modern uh, solar panels twice as efficient as the ones they replaced, which were old. The batteries that are now installed are nearly three times as efficient as the original ones I had. Admittedly, this is an old system, but this is uh, how the, the future will go. And a, a really good example of how this is being led by Australians, uh, not by governments, is that um, I used to live in front of a house that was owned by one of the richest uh, men in Victoria. And um, he installed solar panels. Um, he wasn't trying to uh, defy his government. He was trying to accept the sun. And I think it's a really good example that Australians have understood about solar power for a very long time. And there are some governments who have resisted the very, very obvious that Australia is a sunny country. Thanks so much, Bruce. Did you quickly want to jump in, Anna? Yeah. Oh. oh, it keeps freezing, Anna. I'm so sorry, but you've just frozen again. 
unfortunately. Um, Kevin Rudd, we've got a question here from Michael Cachel. Uh, he's talking about China's, I mean, this was a massive, massive story this year that I think got unfortunately swamped by COVID. Um, should we believe China's commitment to go carbon neutral in 2060? And what role can Australia play in that? And can you just unmute, please? I intend to live to 100 years old, so I'll be around to tell you. Um, so, um, and uh, I'm just looking for some uh, ancient Indigenous wisdom, Bruce, that will enable me to last that long. So we'll talk afterwards, my friend. Um, the um, Chinese system um, is uh, obviously a radically different system to this country. My first point is this. China has decided to act on climate change and to bring down its uh, greenhouse gas emissions for uh, one core reason. Uh, it is a science-based political culture which has concluded that um, climate change produced by uh, the human uh, use of carbon uh, at scale uh, is uh, bringing about irreparable uh, social environmental damage in their country. That's the core reason. And this, there's a scientific consensus on this within China, which was achieved probably about 2007, 2008. It worked its way through the political process by about the, uh, just after Copenhagen at the end of 2009, probably around about 2010. Um, um, and it found its way into China's um, central planning documents uh, round about uh, 2015, the 13th five-year plan. That's kind of the sequence of it. Um, science, politics, policy. Um, and we're about to go into the 14th five-year plan, which will be released um, fairly soon, uh, which will govern China between 2021 and 2025. And what I know about the system is that when a high policy decision is taken, like China shall be uh, carbon neutral um, by 2060, before 2060, and there's room for China to bring that down to 2050. Um, what I know of the system is that it's translated through the five-year planning documents down to all the branches of industry the stationary energy sector, the transport sector, the building and construction sector, and the rest, as well as energy efficiency measures. Uh, and so on balance, uh, I believe that is central to the system. Uh, just two qualifying points there. Because of the COVID impact, uh, you have seen uh, an upsurge in China's um, coal-fired power construction and a pre-COVID upsurge as well uh, or surge, I should say, uh, rather, uh, uptake, of when the economy began to soften in 2018, 2019. Uh, what the Chinese will say to you is that this is a temporary blip against a strategic trend towards uh, the downward use of coal uh, within their country and their long-term transfer through the transition of, uh, of gas uh, into full renewables. And that's because, not because they like you, not because they like me, not because they like Anna, I'm sure they do like Bruce, uh, but the bottom line is it's because they've worked out that's the science and that's their national self-interest. Now, the key question for the Chinese is, will the same science apply to restrictions in their funding by foreign direct investment or by uh, loans from their uh, national financial institutions for coal-fired power station construction in the Belt and Road Initiative countries around the world, outside China, which is currently underway. Mind you, Japan and Korea have been doing the same thing. The challenge there for the Chinese policy elite is to stop that and to, and to apply the same disciplines internationally to those which they are indicating they will apply nationally through the 14th five-year plan. I think that debate is still being had but I think it will be resolved uh, over the course of the next five years in favour of decarbonising the Belt and Road Initiative as well. 
Thanks again, Kevin. And Anna, we had a, a lot of trouble, <laughs> technical problems there. So I do want to give you the opportunity to um, speak up here. We'd love to hear from you, but we only have, you know, around a minute left. We're already over time. So did you want to pick up on any points there about alternatives to coal? I will. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, uh, hydrogen is the other um, alternative that's um, rapidly gaining attention and promise. So uh, I mentioned earlier that hydrogen can substitute for some of the transport fuels, but it can also substitute for coal. The coal that's um, not only when we're talking um, about using renewables to replace coal in electricity, but there is coal that's used in making steel. Hydrogen can be the direct production um, agent in place of coal and use the same and use its chemical properties um, in in place of coal for um, converting iron into steel so that is an extremely promising technology and uh, there's much talk of green steel now as as an alternative um, uh, and and within our within re within reach technologically so there's still a lot of work to do but there is opportunity to do it. And I think that links to your early question about COVID and this moment might be a temporary pause in emissions, but it is a big moment to seize for um, accelerating uh, these investments that the climate action requires. When we published our latest research on the pathways that were needed, it was right on the brink of COVID. And we found that what we could still do just be within reach of the Paris targets, but only if we really accelerated the investment in the technologies, bringing forward what was already mature and developed, uh, but making it mainstream and widespread, and that report the all-in effort. Then COVID struck, and we have, as Bruce mentioned, everyone going all-in. We are working together, and governments are now injecting substantial new investments into their economies. So it's actually a make or break moment for climate. These in, in this injection of investment, um, new research today out for this week from the UK shows that just one tenth of the COVID recovery budgets worldwide would be enough to get us on track for the Paris Agreement targets. But if we don't do that, as you pointed out earlier, Janice, COVID is a huge distraction. It's difficult times in a global recession. Decision makers are busy enough as it is, and we want them to pay more attention to climate action. So if we miss this moment to achieve the double dividend of addressing climate action while addressing COVID recovery, we really miss missing the moment of this decade to turn emissions around and we may cross those tipping points. So um, it is a big moment to grab uh, and, uh, and I hope um, everyone listening can do all that they can to, to, to grab this moment, and we must. Well, certainly, I think there's a lot of momentum behind that sort of sentiment, isn't there, that we've got to use this opportunity to, to rethink and recalibrate how we address certain things and, and especially climate change. So a huge thank you to our panellists, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, uh, also Bruce Pascoe, author and Anna Scarbeck, CEO of ClimateWorks Australia. Thank you so much. We could have easily spoken for another hour. It's just absolutely whipped along, but I'd encourage encourage everyone who's tuned in to maybe keep that conversation going online, get engaged. Uh, the more discussion we have this, the better, I think. Uh, another huge thank you to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt, for his wonderful opening remarks. And of course, to Paul Howes for that lovely welcome to country. Thanks again to everyone for sharing your sage wisdom with us. It's been a real honour to be hosting this. And a big thank you too to everyone at the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation for your tireless work in putting together the 2020 Wilson Dialogue. Uh, thanks to, to the ANU, of course, and a special shout out to Sally Ann Henfrey, Executive Director of the Sir, Sir Roland Wilson Foundation for the hard work she's put into this event this evening, along with her fantastic team. And a big thank you to you, the audience, for tuning in. Um, lovely to have you on board. We really appreciate your support for being engaged in such a significant discussion. It's been my pleasure. I'm Janice Peterson. I shall see you on the news. Good night. <laughs>